We have been displaced. Hearing the word displaced might be puzzling to you. That word usually brings up images of long lines of people moving slowly along dusty roads in a foreign country, bundles of possessions on their backs or crammed into truck beds, total fatigue and fear etched on their faces and entire bodies. Pick a country, pick a year. As Americans with any awareness of world news, we have seen hundreds of displaced people. Clearly none of these images match us. As members of Trinity, we most assuredly are in our houses. Of that fact, we can amply testify. But as the saying goes, looks can be deceiving. Over the last months, we have been displaced. First, we were displaced by a germ. We could no longer live life in the same ways. Work sites were closed, parks off limits, gatherings prohibited, classrooms were empty, doors were locked. Our places were no longer our places. Yes, the surrounding of our homes were familiar, but our bodies, our minds, and our spirits told us that things were different, deeply different. We had been displaced. And then came the murder of George Floyd and the weeks and the numbers of protests just miles away and around the world. At that point, another displacement began to occur as a nation. As whites, we watched videos of the inhumane placement of white power literally on top of people of color rele relegated to their place in American society. And we saw in the protest which followed hundreds of Americans come to a new place together. The crowds were a mix of all ages, skin colors, all economic levels. In this surprising moment, seemingly hundreds of people are making and proclaiming the arrival of a new place. As one member of Trinity said last week to me, I'm living in the middle of a true moment of history, and I don't want to miss it. I want to live it as fully as I can. I didn't ask further what she meant, but the word history caught my attention. My major in college was American history and I taught world history and geography to seventh graders. Even before those years, I wanted to figure out the bigger picture, to stretch to see as far as I could. My favorite childhood summer fun was to climb up a giant willow tree in my Kansas backyard. When I got near the top, as close to the top as I dared go, I could see beyond my grandmother's house, beyond my grandfather's cornfield. I imagined that I was in the crow's nest at the very top of the highest mast in a sailing ship. And the waves were sweeping me back and forth as I made the willow tree bend. My young eyes were searching the horizon for whales. There she blows, I would yell to those below who were paying no attention. Or I would see other ships or just look as far as I could see in Kansas. Decades later, while I am attempting to live spiritually in the moment, 
I am very curious about the moments that human beings lived before me. I'm curious about how people before us made sense and found meaning in their lives. So for a couple of years now, I've been reading about how human awareness of themselves has evolved and changed. And I've learned that there are a whole bunch of bright people around the world who are studying human consciousness. And one of their core hypotheses fascinates me. They are posing that there are certain times in the human's flow and emerging awareness that we arrive at a critical breakthrough. There's a disruption in this steady flow unfolding of humanity. Humans make a deep shift. They rethink themselves. They change what they value. Their eyes see differently. And such breakthroughs have happened more than once. For example, people quit sacrificing their eldest son to placate an angry, resentful deity. Of course, you know that I'm referring to our first reading this morning, the story of Abraham and Isaac going out because God, Abraham thought, told him to sacrifice his only son. We know the story well, and I suspect it's abhorrent to us. We don't know how to make sense of it, and even wonder, I don't know, I do, why we keep reading it on Sunday and forcing preachers to either ignore it or cloak it into some kind of disguise. Well, I'm not gonna do either. For this story is part of our human story. Our ancestors around the world for decades, generations behind us search just like we do on how to be spiritual beings and to find rituals that connected them with nature and people and their understanding of the, the ground of all being. And along with the discovery of fire and bows and arrows and how to plant seeds, humans' doings also had a human being's story, how we made meaning. And so at one point, giving the gods the most precious item in your tent was in the human consciousness story. Yeah, we don't live there anymore, do we? Our minds don't think that way anymore. We can't imagine considering such a deed. Human consciousness evolves, and not always slowly, but sometimes in what seems like the blink of an eye and viewed from the top of a willow tree in Kansas. Seen from a larger perspective, history, our story, opens into a new place. Think about it. A hundred years ago, the hundred years from 1770 to 1870, in those hundred years, what happened? The American and French revolutions protesting that monarchy was no longer the expected form of government. Slavery was outlawed around the world. The rise of every modern science from chemistry to sociology to medicine, psychology, the earliest forms of feminism and an appeal for universal human rights. And then about a hundred years later, in the 1960s, people questioned corporate life, civil rights, 
ecological standards. Human consciousness evolves. In the recent words of an African-American Christian theologian, Dr. Barbara Holmes, we are not hamsters on a wheel waiting to fall into the cedar shavings at the bottom of the cage. We are seekers of light and life, bearers of shadows and burdens. We are struggling to journey together toward moral fulfillment. We are learning to embrace the unfathomable darkness where God dwells with enthusiasm that equals our love of light. Not hamsters on a wheel, waiting to fall into the cedar shavings at the bottom of the cage. We are seekers of light and life, bearers of shadows and burdens. Or in the words of Jesus's gospel this morning, whoever welcomes you welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Do you hear the flow and the movement of those words? Whoever welcomes you welcomes me. Who else welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Jesus says there is a larger movement going on here. Whoever welcomes is part of a bigger movement. Jesus tells us we're on a journey with others who are also bearers of God's evolving light. Were we not baptized and marked as Christ's own forever? Are we not part of something so much bigger than ourselves or this moment? Jesus is the Christ, and the good news is that his words and actions in his time point to beyond his time. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega as the Christ. His life and his light are drawing all creation into reconciliation and healing and love. We are part of Jesus Christ. We have a place in the divine flow in which even a seemingly small single action matters. Even a thought matters. A cup of water offered to a child. Yes, we have been displaced in order that we might find our true place, that we might know in the deepest part of our being, in our minds and in our hearts and in our bodies, that we are in a wholeness of life and that our displacement is part of our journey to live into the greater wholeness that is promised by Jesus Christ. We are followers. Amen.